Learning is neat. I really like it. Pokemon are neat too, especially spelled with another E. Don't remember that joke. What is it supposed to be? <laughs> neat, spelled N-E-E-T, because the acronym. It's a dumb joke. <laughs> so in this video, like most, we're going to combine learning with Pokemon. We're going to go over how exactly electric type Pokemon probably work, what they are and how they function or would function in our world. A fun exercise to keep up with those new year resolutions of learning. You haven't ditched them already, have you? Mine was to stop talking to myself, but you're a camera, so it doesn't count, right? Right? Answer me, please. Broken promises aside, the electric type is rather interesting at its core, unlike fire or water. Those Pokémon are either magic or just cheaters of physics, but Electric-type Pokémon have a basis in our real world. That's right, and I'm sure it's overhyped to heck, but the Electric Eel is basically already a Pokémon. But not really. It's an eel. But not really. It's not an eel, actually. It's actually a knife fish. But we all incorrectly call it an eel anyway, so, you know. Humans are stupid. That's why I'm here helping you. Not that I'm not a human. Or anything. But I mean, I don't blame you, uh, us, because they look super similar to an eel. And I mean, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it could very well be a goose or a frog, but you just need glasses. But we're not talking Psyducks, we're talking Elekids here. Though an electric duck Pokemon would be great. I mean, it's already yellow. That's the number one thing a Pokemon needs to be electric type. Electric Pokemon can be either yellow and black, or have red and blue on them which are basically magnet colors. And magnets are basically electricity, right? Well, actually, yes. In fact, magnets are the driving force behind electricity. Think of a power generator. It works because its metal wires spun around a magnet to create charge. This is the reason so many magnetic Pokemon are electric type, or at the very least, no electric moves. Also, Rotom, it's motor backwards. And what is a motor but a reverse generator? Magnetism is one of the forces of nature. Without magnetic fields, things couldn't be charged. And this not only includes our machines, but even us, to an extent. But the Pokémon world is a magical world. You don't need to apply science, you can simply just say that these magical creatures generate electricity with magic because they're magical creatures. And yeah, you're right, so you're done here. Leave. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're gonna have some fun. So, how would an Electric-type Pokémon really generate electricity? Well, let's first look at the classic example, our friend, the Knife Fish which is also known as the electric eel. Oh, there he is now, swimming, or doing whatever the stock footage we could find of him is doing. Nice. Now, with my magical editing powers, I'm going to point out this part. That's the tail. And all along the tail, which makes up almost the entire body of a knife fish, there are tiny little cells called electrocytes. There's thousands of them in this little booty. These cells are capable of great things, if you're an eel or, or a knife fish. But to most other living organisms, well, this uh, may come as a shock to you. But they aren't the best news for your survival. These cells are able to produce charge. Or more realistically, they are able to change their charge from negative to positive. This is unique, you see. Technically, all creatures, including humans, have these things called ions in their bodies. In fact, every cell of our being has ions. They are pretty important stuff. Ions are able to carry charge. That's because an ion is a molecule that has either gained or lost an electron. For an easy example of an ion, let's take hydrogen. It's got one electron and one proton. Now, because of how physics works, it either wants to lose its electron or find a buddy for it. Because its lowest electron shell needs two electrons. So when it gives the electron to, say, oxygen, it becomes slightly charged. Thankfully now, they share the electrons. So hydrogen gets to sometimes have two, although oxygen is kind of a bully, so it gets the electron more of the time, but hey, they're sharing. And to get too deep into this would be a whole extra video. So, uh, moving on. When the hydrogen atom has zero electrons, it's positively charged, as it's got more protons. And then when it does have the two electrons, it's negatively charged. This is the basis of charge, the movement and difference of electron balances. Why our cells do this is a whole other topic, but it boils down to, well, Without it, our cells couldn't do a bunch of the stuff they need to do to survive. So yeah, animals, and we humans, run on electricity. Granted, it's a very, very small amount, but this is why you need to ingest electrolytes. They help us with all this. 
It says ions right there. But the electric eel, now that thing takes things to a whole other level, similarly to electric Pokemon. Presumably for now, the electric eel's body is filled with those electrocytes, and those all get together and decide that they want to build charge. They do so by moving their electrons around via small channels in their body called ion channels. Each one is only able to produce a minuscule amount of charge, worthless amounts honestly, but there are thousands of them, and together they are able to make a potential difference that has the ability to produce almost 700 volts. Wow, a number that means nothing! You would know that if you've seen our other electricity video, but knowing the voltages alone, that's worthless. But 700 volts with about one ampere? Now that's a step in the right direction. Even with both pieces of info, you're sort of at a loss to what it even means, but 700 volts at one amp is like getting hit with a weaker stun gun. Maybe its batteries are low, but it still is shocking you enough to hurt. Similar to how Pikachu has shocked Ash a billion times, but you know, it's just a little zap, it's fine. Though, these fish are normally zapping prey that's significantly smaller than we are, so to the prey, it's much more lethal. Key notes about our electric knife fish eel friends. One, their electrical organ looks gross. And two, they are severely inefficient at generating electricity. I mean, it takes a bunch of energy to move all those tiny ions across its whole super long body, meaning, that it needs to use its electricity sparingly, only using exactly what it needs to stun its prey or deter predators. And this is where the similarities end between this fish and Pokemon. I mean, they can create insane amounts of electricity from a diet of berries or even just regular old ketchup. Let's be truthful. Ketchup is just a mashed tomato berry. But anyway, while a lot of Electric-type Pokémon likely generate their power in a similar method, just at a much higher scale, not all Electric-type Pokémon make power this way. In fact, a lot of Pokédex entries mention how they do it individually, and quite a few of them state that it's static electricity. So how does that work? Well, similar to the eel, it's based off of electric potential differences in the object. One is positive, and one is negative. Like a battery, there's the positive and the negative side. So they rush around. And once they touch, the electrons rush over to the positive side, creating the flash of energy. All things in the world love to be balanced. Except my diet. Get those brains out of here. Fun fact, did you know that this is the main way we weld metal together? Arc welding is using electrical potentials in the metal and the rod to create intense heat, which is so hot that it near instantly melts the metal that they are using to glue the pieces together. So really, some of these Pokémon should be able to fuse other Pokémon to each other just by touch. And that brings up a question, when attacking, the energy is still flowing through both Pokémon, and it only hurts one of them. How is the electric Pokémon undamaged? In my welding example, they have a rod that is almost like a sacrificial rod that slowly decays as the weld is continued, some even just using that rod as the metal glue. So shouldn't some Pokémon be losing fingers or other body parts due to the intense heat? And they can't all just be non-conducting parts because they have to conduct the electricity out of themselves and into the other. Well, let's take another look at the electric eel again. This poor electric eel actually has no real immunity to electricity. It's their ability to conduct that allows them to shock. And so long as you make a complete circuit, the pain won't fully ensue. You can see videos of people playing around with this concept. As long as they don't let go of each other, nobody is hurt. The electricity is flowing right through them, no issue. This is sort of what the eel does. It curves its body and uses the water between to form a complete circuit. But if you take it out of the water, that charge has nowhere to go as air is a pretty good resistor. So out of the water, the energy is trapped in the eel. But this doesn't mean that in the water the eels are always fine either. They accidentally shock themselves all the time, similar to the people letting go. If the circuit gets broken before the electricity finishes, well, it hurts! If the eel doesn't bend enough or it gets bumped, welcome to Pain City. In fact, they purposefully bend themselves in a way that causes the electricity to avoid their heart altogether just in case they mess up. Unlike the eel, humans don't really have anything to direct charge, so if we get hit with charge like this, the energy goes wild until it finds a way out, and then it all goes that way quickly. You can see this in slow motion lightning. Lightning comes down from the sky in so many directions everywhere, and then once it finds a single path to go down, it all goes. Basically, when getting shocked, this is happening, but in your body. But again, these eels don't have the massive amounts of power that Pokémon have. So how would a Pokémon be safe from the charge? 
Well, in some cases, it's easy. Some of them use their tendrils to shock their prey, like Electrovire. In fact, I imagine that it uses its tendrils as a half circuit, one being positive, one being negative. I mean, they are even colored red and blue, and that's also exactly what the Pokedex says. All right, educated guess, I guess. I am, and it's right, huh. But loads of electric Pokemon use their electrical prowess to direct the current through the air, creating thunderbolts. And then there's some that use the negative charge of the earth to pull positive charge from the atmosphere, like a lightning rod which is actually quite possible, and it's actually based off of science. Not just mumbo-jumbo Game Freak magic. You see, the way thunderclouds are able to strike the Earth with lightning is because the Earth is generally negatively charged. Now fun fact time! When you think of electricity, you tend to think of it moving really, really fast, like lightning, you know? It's there to there, it's super instant. You tend to think that it's the positive energy just and down into the negative super instantly, but that's wrong. Electricity is pretty slow, actually. Think of a power cable as a tube filled with marbles, and each marble is an electron. Every time you put a marble in the positive side, the marble at the other end immediately comes out. It's seemingly fast. I mean, you just flicked the light switch on and the bulb is on immediately. But it actually takes a while for the electron marble you just put in to get all the way to the other side of the tube. It just seems instant because, you know, it's always there. You put one in, one comes out right away. Boy, that's not the same one you put in. Now back to thunderclouds. The earth is negative, and the air is a great insulator, especially compared to water. However, every insulator has a breaking point, which is why lightning strikes tend to be uh, immensely powerful. They need to be. Some have up to 10 columns of energy, or a gigajoule, which is a lot. Trust me. So those moves that Pokemon use that state 10,000 volts got nothing on Mother Nature. One single bolt of lightning could have up to a billion volts of energy and up to 200,000 amps. Most strikes aren't that high, but still that's possible. That's in the scale of what lightning can be. It's ridiculous. And all this energy is just sitting up there in the clouds. Again. So it's not all that ridiculous to have a Pokemon be able to draw the energy from the surrounding clouds. If they are all able to charge themselves to be the opposite, so negative for the most part, then they would become almost like a huge beacon, and it draws the energy down upon itself. The same could be said of the opponent Pokemon you're battling. Perhaps an electric type Pokemon is able to negatively charge the opponent, essentially turning them into a lightning rod temporarily. But since the opponent isn't inherently electric type, well, it hurts them a lot more than when it does hit an electric type. So, it seems that we sort of understand how these electric types are capable of creating energy, or more realistically, move the charge of tiny ions to create large sums of electrical difference. Clearly, though, because of the levels they're capable of doing it at, there has to be some level of magic going on, but the best magic is at least mostly explainable by science. But so far, we're just sort of talking generic electric type Pokemon, the bulk of them, the vast majority of them. But what about some of the more special Pokemon? Like Pikachu. The most special Pokemon of all. <laughs> it is said that Pikachu uses its cheeks to store charge. Now, a lot of electric Pokemon store electricity, which is totally possible, just think of batteries, but could organic batteries actually exist? Well, they sort of already do. So electricity is energy that you need to use other energies to make, be it chemically or kinetically. Water spinning a turbine would be kinetic, while our bodies using the food we eat would be a chemical way. Think of your generic battery. It doesn't need to be shaken, right? Well, maybe some of them do, but most batteries are based off of chemical reactions. Remember the eel, the same basic principles apply. There are ions that flow from one side to the other to create a difference of charge. Thus, it's moving the electrons and such so that there is a current. But if you've ever taken a battery apart, which you should never do, you would find something interesting. Let's take a double A for example. They have tiny disks stacked on top of each other. Each one of them is moving so many electrons, but together they create a much bigger charge. Again, just like the eel. So Pikachu storing energy in its cheeks would be him moving the ions with chemical energy gained from its ketchup intake. So it's storing its negative and positive ions, likely in each cheek, to move them from one cheek to the other, or maybe just around in a circle. 
This method of storage actually is very common in Pokemon. Basically, all of the Pikachu clones and Zolt have cheeks like this. And plenty others likely have similar organs elsewhere in their bodies too. And then of course, there are those magnetic Pokemon we talked about earlier, using magnets to charge the wires inside of them to shock their opponents. So Magneton, Alolan Geodude, possibly Voltorb, though the magnet itself isn't as powerful in it, those kinds of Pokemon. And I also feel like Elekid would be here too, as it spins its arms to gain charge, spinning some parts inside of it. Something akin to a magnet and wire would be the most efficient. And possibly Zekrom fits here too, as its tail is basically a generator which uses magnets to create electricity. Though, there's of course the idea that Zekrom, Reshiram, and Kyurem, which were all once originally one single dragon, are all based on fusion energy, basically a nuclear generator, which creates a lot of heat and a lot of electricity, and desperately needs a coolant, thus the three of them. So it's possible that that's how Zekrom creates its immense amount of power, but the magnet thing is true also, because you take all the heat generated and then use it to heat water up to steam rise and that spins a turbine. That's basically the same. And then there are electric Pokemon that generate their power through vibration, which is also static or even just thunderclouds. The only reason thunderclouds are charged is because there's so many tiny particles just bouncing off of each other up there, striking their electrons together, stealing them and losing them a whole bunch. It's just a party. But because a single cloud could be 1.1 million pounds of excited water molecules bouncing around in a gaseous state, well, this causes them to be gaining charge all the time. The individual's charge is nothing, but they are all part of a trillion, and together that creates an insane amount of power. Zapdos lives in thunder clouds. It's a thunderbird, and by living there, it can simply absorb all of the energy around it, like a lightning rod. Except it's in the clouds, and it's a bird that is able to also freely control thunder clouds. Meaning, of course, that it is one of the stronger electric type Pokémon. Fitting of a legendary. Almost every electric Pokémon is capable of calling down the power of the clouds with moves like Thunder, but not all of them might be able to easily use that power simply by existing, or even direct it into themselves for storage rather than just redirecting it into the opponent immediately. But there are more ways to use static vibration to build charge. Take Mareep for example. I'm sure it just uses the static of its wool to generate charge. All those fibers rubbing up against each other constantly causes the electrons to move around. Compared to most other fibers, especially synthetic ones, wool has a lot of water content. About a sixth of it is water, which helps in the electron moving and charge storage. Which is why when wearing a wool sweater, it's, it's so easy to just shock people with static electricity. And this is potentially similar to the idea that many of the fast Electro Pokemon use. Their muscles move so fast that they are able to create this extra energy, extra friction with themselves. You see those crank and shake phone chargers all the time. Same idea. And they're likely also using electricity to contract their muscles faster than normal. These Pokemon are hybrids. But then, there are some electric type Pokemon that can't actually generate their own electricity whatsoever. And they just have those organic batteries to store it when it happens to come their way. You know, like Joltik, who, like a tick, needs to absorb static electricity from other Pokemon, or people even. And Togedemaru isn't even able to actively steal it. Instead, it needs to be hit with electricity to power itself up. Though it is literally a lightning rod. Which helps. The other odd ones are Helioptile, who uses solar panels to gain its energy. Basically photosynthesis, so like that one salamander. Ambistoma maculatum. Speaking of which, uh, you would have to eat 42 million calories to produce one gigajoule. You know, one lightning strike. It's a good thing Pokemon are much more efficient than that with their power generation. I mean, suspension of this belief can only go so far. We're talking about Pokemon and suspension of disbelief. Hmm. Never stop using your noggin. <laughs>